um, and then I, I said I beat out 250 other people, all of which had met the qualifications and I didn't, right? Because yeah. they don't hire based on qualifications. They hi people hire based on your ability to solve a problem. This is the Hard Thing Podcast. Today, we are overcoming average. I want to welcome you back to another episode of the Hard Thing Podcast. This is the podcast that helps you overcome average, step up above mediocrity, all by doing hard things. You see, our, our goal here is to help you do those strategic hard things that are going to improve your life that you've probably been avoiding, but you, you know, you just don't want to do. So we're going to help you do them. And today is our Monday show. So you hear from me and a guest. I'm excited about today's show. But before we get into that, a couple announcements. I want to invite you to go over to our website, The Hard Thing Podcast, and check it out. See what we got going on there. We actually have some t-shirts and hoodies. Uh, as well, I want to encourage you to check out our Facebook group. See what other like-minded people are doing over there. And uh, band with other people to overcome the average that is in your life. As well... Help us raise $1,000 for Operation Underground Railroad. They are a nonprofit organization that goes undercover to rescue kids from sex trafficking. They're, they're tremendous. Honestly, we need to help them out because they need a lot of help, but they're doing really good work. So uh, if you want to help us raise $1,000, go to GoFundMe.com slash Overcoming-Average and uh, donate some money there. And also for the Facebook group, that's facebook.com slash groups slash The Hard Thing Podcast. Figured I'd mention that. But now let's talk about today's guest today. I talk with Richard Matthews, and Richard is the host of the Hero Show, a, a podcast, as well as uh, he runs the Push Button Podcast program, which helps established local businesses who are using a podcast in their business development efforts. And Richard has been in marketing for 10 plus years now, and he, he's just such a fascinating guy. Um, today, we talk about a lot of things. We talk about entrepreneurship. We talk about ending a business and then finding a way to really go after a job that you really want and nail it. And then last but not least, we find we talk about how to identify problems and solve those problems and using that to both get the jobs you want, but also market yourself as you need to, whether that's in business, whether that's in finding a job or whether that's in, you know, getting the woman you love to ask you to marry you or whatever. Uh, marketing is important because you're, we're always trying to solve problems. And I love how he framed it today. Uh, especially he, he has a, a, a quote that I, I, uh, <laughs> I really enjoy. It's marketing is identifying patterns or something like that. And, uh, I, I think that's so vital for being successful. So anyways, go up ahead and listen to my conversation with Richard Matthews. All right. Well, thank you for being on my show, Richard. I'm very excited to have this conversation with you today. Awesome. Thanks for uh, having me on. Really uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to your audience. For sure. Uh, well, let's get started with the question that I ask all my guests. Ready or not, here it comes. What's the hardest thing you've ever done? So there are um, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because I feel like there's silos of life yeah. and you could say the hardest thing in this area. Um, so I think I'm going to go with an area in business. One of the hardest things that I remember doing, um, was admitting defeat, um, in a business that I had been running for a number of years. So I, um, out of college, after a whole bunch of different uh, um, business things growing up, um, I had started a, uh, what would you call it, uh, a marketing consulting firm working with local businesses, um, 2007, 2008 time frame when we were, I was helping people build like mobile websites for the first time and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really where my agency started. And I built that for a number of years, all the way up till 2012. Um, and I, um, got to a point December of 2012 where I was just floundering and I wasn't floundering in the business because I wasn't delivering great results for my clients. I was doing a great job for my clients. My problem was I was starving myself, right? Um, I was not charging enough money for what I was delivering to have enough cash flow in the business to both serve my clients and get new clients and things like that. So we were very much feast or famining in the business um, and constantly, you know, struggling with how am I going to get the next client and those kind of things when projects ended. Um, Cause I, I didn't, I wasn't charging enough money. Essentially I was, I was doing things that for, you know, 
a quarter the price of what a chief labor person would do for things um, at a very, very high level of, of work. Um, and a lot of that had to do with my own confidence in my skills, right? I didn't think I was worthy of charging as much as I was worth, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so in December of 2012, I shut the business down and I informed all of my clients and I let them all go essentially. I said, I'm basically, I'm shutting my business down. Um, and that was a hard thing to do for someone who's been in the entrepreneur space since I was 13 years old and thought, figured I would never, you know, be one for a job or things like that. And I was just like, you know what, I, I feel like I'm not, I'm not getting where I want to go with my business. Um, but I used that as a springboard in my, um, in my life to help push to a next, the next area. So I had a couple of rules for getting a job. Um, I wanted to take a director position, like a C-level director position in marketing. Um, and I wanted to be in control of a marketing budget that was at least $10,000 a month so I could take the skills that I was already developing in my business and over the course of my life and really hone them in um, with a big corporate company that was doing a lot of big things and cool things in the market. And so I wanted to have that like level of work that I was doing, but I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to have to worry about feeding my kids, right? I didn't have to worry about like money coming in this month. I just wanted to just focus on developing the skill set. Um, so um, shutting my business down was really hard. Um, and then I spent the next four and a half weeks um, and I found, I found a single position that I thought that would be perfect for me. Um, and I put everything I had into getting that one position, which was, uh, was, was super fun. Um, but I was up against 250 other applicants for a C-level <laughs> director of marketing position they were looking for someone who had 10 years of experience and a four year degree in marketing and oh, like yeah, every, yeah. all the, all these bullet points. And I literally had none of them, not a mm -hmm. single one of the qualifications they had. Um, and they were offering, I think $60,000 a year cause they were looking to bring someone in and develop them. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I came in, um, and over the course of those four weeks, I beat out 250 other applicants um, and I got them to give me a hundred thousand dollar salary, wow. um, work from home. Um, uh, I got them to, to have me work from home. Um, and then I also got them to pay me for the four weeks previous that I put into the effort <laughs> of getting that job. Um, so it was like, I was, I was good at the marketing stuff. Yeah. Like that's the, my, my point there. So I, I got them to, to give that position. I spent the next two years with them. Um, 15, well, it was, I guess it was closer to like 16 or 17 months. Um, and 10 X their business, um, 10 X their lead flow in their business anyways, because that's what I was in charge of was the leads. Um, and that led to about $50 million in sales for that company as a big solar company organization. So they're selling high ticket items. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I, uh, um, was in charge of a $25,000 a month marketing budget and a small marketing team. And, um, and then at the end of that, my time there, I, I gave them a three month notice and helped them find, hire and train someone to replace me, um, and went back and started my business again. Um, so it was, it was a really positive experience. Um, but to the point of your question, making that decision to say, you know what, I think I need to give up, right? I need to shut down what I've been working on for, what was 2007, 2012, like what five, that's five years, right? Five, five years into my, my business. And I was like, I just, I can't do it. I need to go and get a job. Um, and, uh, um, so that was a hard decision to make. Um, but you can take hard decisions like that and turn them into, you know, more experience and more benefits and more stacking of skills to, uh, to, you know, sort of up level your life. For sure. Uh, that is quite, quite the story. I don't think I've ever heard anyone who has gone in, in, in a job finding endeavor and, and come out on top so much like that. Um, I kind of want to dig in a little bit more though, to actually making the decision. You, you said you're starving yourself and you felt like you, your confidence wasn't there. If you don't mind me asking, why do you feel like your confidence wasn't there to allow you to charge what you should have been charging? So, um, it was, it, I was afraid, right? It was a fear thing. Um, and, uh, and it was, it was a, uh, like looking back on it, it, it was a fear of rejection, right? The idea that if I went to my clients and just as an example, one of the things I was doing at the time was helping, um, helping businesses develop their websites, right? So local businesses that didn't have an online presence at the time, 
um, which is funny because you go back, that's like 10 years ago and yeah. you're like, there were local businesses that didn't have websites. <laughs> it was weird yeah. as crap. But yeah, so we were helping getting businesses online and I would go in and we would talk to them and they definitely wanted to get a website and things like that. And we get to the point where it was like asking for a price. Um, and I was doing things like, I was really, really good, right? I could develop a whole website from beginning to end with all their content, everything they needed in a couple of hours, wow. right? And um, cause I had all, everything, the template, and I still do the same thing, right? I just helped mm-hmm. a client the other day. We went from zero to complete e-commerce site, all their products, everything up in, in two and a half hours. <laughs> so, but my problem was I was still thinking like these, this is a business owner. They're looking to hire someone like they would hire an employee. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, they're looking to hire someone for a website and I was charging them like a hundred bucks to do that. <laughs> right. Um, Wow. And, and so like, they were like flipping their lids on the kind of stuff that I was delivering for them. Cause another firm would charge them $5,000 to do the same thing yeah. and deliver it in six weeks, not in two hours. <laughs> yeah. um, so like for me, I was like, I couldn't see myself asking for more than like a waged employee, if that makes sense. Yeah. I was like there, cause it like in my head, I was not thinking of trading value. I was thinking of the time I was putting in. Right. I was like, it takes me two hours. I'm only worth, you know, $15 an hour. So, <laughs> so like, you know, I know I should be charging more than that. So maybe I'll do a hundred bucks and we'll do that kind of thing. So I was, I was literally starving myself. Wow. Um, and it was, it was a mental disconnect where I was not associating the value I was bringing to the table. Um, um, and I wasn't, I wasn't associating that with the, the monetary value to the business person in terms of time, convenience, someone who's got a skill set, someone they don't have to go back and forth on questions and all that kind of stuff that like nowadays I understand when I walk into, to a business or to the people that I serve in my, in my area that I have years and years of experience and I can do things um, better, cheaper, faster, and to a higher degree than pretty much anyone else in my space. Um, that there's a lot of value that goes with that. So like my services are all top tier at this point, which allows me to do a lot of things, right? Where I can, I have staff members and I have other things now that like when we deliver, when we, um, someone hires us um, to do things, we still keep the delivery, but we have the high level of quality service. And what's fun is like today, um, I, you know, popped up this morning and checked on all the things that we had to do um, and just made sure all of my staff had everything they needed to do. And I spent the afternoon at the pool with my kids. <laughs> that was my day. My day yeah. was like, I'm, you can probably tell I'm like sweaty and red. I was at the <laughs> pool all day. Um, and my business ran, um, I say without me, it wasn't really without me. Like I was checking on things to keep things, sure. keeping things out, like in line, but I spent the day at the pool. Right. And still yeah. got paid and all those kind of things. So, um, a lot of that has to do with like, I know how to charge now. I know how to, to, to make that distinction between value given versus value received. So, and I know that going back in time, you know, metaphorically, isn't always a fruitful conversation, but if you were to go back in time and give yourself advice, and this is primarily for those entrepreneurs out there who are starting up a similar business where it's, you know, very new, they're still trying to figure out how to price it. What advice would you give to yourself or them to, to learn how to find how much value you're giving versus how much you should charge? So, um, I, I want to I want to twist the question just a little bit because sure. I think um, one of the more important things is understanding because with with pricing comes secondary to skill, okay. right? To skill and del- the ability to deliver. Um, and so you, you know you've heard the term imposter syndrome before, right? People are always mm-hmm. they struggle with imposter syndrome, like I, and that's what I was struggling with. I'm not sure if I'm worth these kind of things, that kind of thing. So imposter syndrome is something, um, this is a really important distinction to make, is you can either be an imposter or you can have imposter syndrome, right? So an imposter is someone that doesn't actually have the skill set, that doesn't have the ability to deliver, right? And they're saying they do, right? And if that's you, the thing that you need to do is not work on pricing and not work on how you deliver to the market. You need to work on developing the skill set. Right. You needed to work on actually being able to deliver. Now, if you're on the other side where you have the skill set like I did and you're suffering from imposter syndrome, what you need to do is you actually need to to learn how to have the confidence and realize that, hey, I actually have this skill set and I know how to, to deliver for it and then set your your uh, your prices accordingly. Now, um, one of the things that I find really helpful is if you're at the beginning of that skill set curve where you're developing a skill is you can switch, flip the script on your, the people that are hiring you, right? And instead of coming in and saying, hey, I have a skill set when you know you really don't, 
is you can come in and be like, hey, I'm new at this, right? And just be honest. I'm new at this. I'm working at developing the skill set. I'm looking for a couple of clients that I can test this out on. Here's what I'm doing for pricing because of that, right? Maybe you have a discount or things like that. And you can go in and, and be like, I want to learn with you. And what I can bring to the table is I can bring a new, a fresh perspective and I can bring a willingness to work and these kind of things. And you can actually lay that out and you'll be surprised the number of people who will actually hire you in that space. Pause on the conversation, guys. Uh, today, we talk a lot about being strategic, doing things that move the needle. And let me tell you, one of the things that have moved the needle more than anything else in my life, one of them, not, not all of them, obviously, is listening to audiobooks because... I find I can ingest the media at a faster rate and retain a lot of it. And if I can't, I can just go back and, and listen to it again uh, quicker. So I wanted to give you the chance to listen to an audiobook for free from Audible. So Audible offers over 180,000 titles on all sorts of genres. And specifically, they offer them on self-help, personal development books. And I want to recommend to you Grit by Angela Duckworth because that book is it has topics that are central to what this podcast is all about so go ahead and go get a free copy of grit by going to audibletrial.com slash the hard thing podcast get your free copy of grit as well as start your free 30 day trial today and while you do that though i'm going to get back to the show Um, for a number of reasons. One, because the fresh perspective is invaluable in uh, in, in a landscape that's changing all the time um, and second if you're new and you're young and you're in a space and you're trying to make a name for yourself, there's a lot of people who are, who are more established in the business community that love to, to reach down and help lift people up like that. And it also helps them, they can develop for themselves service providers that work the way they want to work, right? So it's a, it's a benefit to hire someone who's new and young if you can say like, hey, if you can do it in this way and accomplish these things, um, then like you've got a client for life kind of thing. So there's value in that. You don't have to, you don't have to be the imposter, so to speak. And what's interesting is I've had a number of experience over the last 15 years or so in my business where I've, I've had clients be like, Hey, I've got this problem. Can you help me solve that problem? And I've had to tell them, I don't have a damn clue how you solve that. But what I'm willing to do is I'm willing to learn, right? I'm willing to learn how to solve that problem. Um, and so like I had just as an example, I had one client who had a uh, tracking issue in their business where they were having a difficulty um, tracking across platforms from online online ads to offline closed sales and how you actually track which ad was leading to which offline closed sale. Um, and it's a big problem in the marketplace, but a lot of uh, there, there wasn't any good solutions for it. And they were like, can you help me solve this? And I was like, I don't know, but I'm willing to experiment with you if you want me to try and I was like, my regular retainer rate is here. And if you want to pay that retainer, I will put the time and effort into figuring it out with, as long as you understand one of the options is we may not be able to figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I'm being very honest and upfront with them. And they were like, you know what? It's worth it to me to take that risk if you think you can try and figure it out. And we actually spent about two and a half months on a retainer. But at the end of the two and a half months, we came up with a solution. We had a uh, had come up with a way to actually bridge that gap and um, and created some unique tracking solutions for them. Um, and it was totally worth it for them. And it was something that now that I had developed that um, and had a client pay for the development of that, I could bring it to all my other clients and be like, hey, we can do this now, right? Mm -hmm. And turn it into another service. But it was something that I didn't have a set price for. I didn't have a skill set in that space. I didn't have anything other than a willingness to just put my head you know, nose to the grindstone type of thing and figure it out. And we did. Um, so I think young entrepreneurs would do, uh, do well to have that kind of a mindset. One is, and like, it's basically be honest with who you are, where you are, what your skill sets are, and understand that the business community is, is, is very apt to help develop new entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I, th that story is very fascinating to me, especially because I, I've always been of the opinion that uh, maybe candor, candor is the word I would use being very uh what's the word just being honest with people honest exactly yeah just just telling them how it is and kind of letting things fall as they may obviously you're not using that to replace hard work or replace skill but you let them know that hey i don't have this skill quite yet i'm changing my pricing structure to reflect that i still want to work with you and i think we can find a solution given enough time and, and given enough energy and i i think that is such an insightful conversation because it almost especially what you did with your client it you tell them how it is 
but you've built this reputation up where they, they, they've seen you produce results in the past. So they have mm-hmm. uh, a justifiable reason to believe that you can produce results in the future. And then they pay that retainer's fee. And then now the onus is on you to provide the value back to them. So if you mm-hmm. don't, that just ruins your reputation and you've lost your business plus whoever they might have affected. And it's just a, such a forward way of thinking about business that I, I find so impressive. Yeah, um, it's actually, it, it, uh, um, I've gone back to doing some things like that in the, in the, uh, in the midst of our you know, global crisis we're currently dealing with. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the things that um, we lost a couple of clients at the beginning of the crisis because their business just wasn't suited to handle what happened, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, that, that, that stuff happens. Um, and uh, I remember thinking, it was like, okay, in order for me to keep my staff on and we're going to have to replace some of those clients and some of those retainers and whatnot. Um, so I started reaching out to, uh, to my network and things like that. Um, and we got a couple of referrals come in. Um, and just as an example, one of the clients that we just closed, um, they came to me as a referral um, saying they had a problem with one of their e-commerce stores they've been trying to figure out for like six months. And they had another developer working on things and doing stuff for, um, for that store. And I talked to him for about an hour on the phone. And I was like, actually, I think I'm, I'm fairly certain I know how to solve your problem. Um, and he was like, okay. And I, was, I had him send me over the details that I needed to, to solve the problem for him. Um, and it took me about 20 minutes and I solved the problem <laughs> that they had, um, which is, that's, that's not the fun part of the story. That's just, it was a really simple problem that like, if someone, if they knew what they were supposed to know, they would have mm-hmm. been able to fix it. Um, so but anyways, I did know that. So we, we fixed it and I got it up for them and we got it running and then he returned it back and he was like, holy balls, right? Like how much do I owe you for fixing all of that? Um, and I just told him, I was like, Hey, first one is free right? Just keep me in mind when you have more business that you need. And I gave him a list, like, here's the kind of things that we do. We operate on a retainer. Here's how our retainer works. And here's what we include in that. Um, and I was like, just keep me in mind when you have more business you want. Within two days, he called me back. He's like, my whole team wants you. Like, where do we sign <laughs> for the retainer retainer thing, right? Um, and and we've done that now, twice now and closed uh, two new retainers over the uh, course of our our, uh, our whatever you call it over this, cri- the, you know, the global crisis, because we, we've just flipped our business model a little bit where we're like, hey, let me, let me come in and sh- deliver for you first for free <laughs> yeah. um, just as a goodwill play to show you that not only can we do what we do, but you get to see how our communication works. You get to see what our product output looks like. You get to see what we can actually deliver um, with a, a very honest, like, I don't actually care if you hire me, right? Because mm-hmm. we're, our business is doing well. Um, I don't actually need the additional revenue. I don't need to have you as a client. Um, but if you want to have someone who's our caliber, we're here. We've got a couple of spaces that opened up kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that's a, it's a powerful message um, to be able to send someone. Um, and it's funny because that's how I started a lot of my business stuff. But as a young entrepreneur is let me do something for you um, to just for free right? And show you that I can do this. Then we would turn that into paying gigs and whatnot. My problem as a younger entrepreneur is I didn't turn it into good paying gigs, right? And nowadays I'm turning them into high ticket retainers and stuff like that, that allows me to, you know, hire and retain a team and do these kind of things um, and deliver it a really high quality. But it's interesting that, you know, in the midst of a crisis, going back to some of those early tactics we used to get clients is working really well. Yeah. And I think that model of give before you get is more it's more common than people realize, especially you think about uh, YouTube channels and uh, podcasters for sure. And, and especially a, a lot of things on the digital space is definitely give before you get blog posts and things like that. And I'd be interested to see if more businesses don't switch to more of that method of here, try a sample. You know, we all go to Costco for the samples, you know what I mean? Cause we want to taste it. Yeah. And then we end up probably most of us end up getting one of those <laughs> things cause we like how they taste. Right. It's yeah. Like, yeah. It was, um, one of my uh, mentors who, if you've in the, any of the uh, online education space, uh, Frank Kern always used to say that, uh, um, you know, prove to them that you can help them by actually helping them. Yeah. The proof is in the pudding. <laughs> Um, yeah. that, you know, but I, I want to switch gears a little bit, uh, move for a bit in time. And I want to dig in if, if only briefly, just when you had identified the one job position that you wanted, you identified one and you put everything you had into getting that I, again, very briefly, cause I, I still want to go on and, and talk about some of the other things, but what sort of things did you do to 
make yourself more attractive as a candidate and eventually acquire that position? Um, so that's actually, it's a fun story. Um, and it's actually a technique. You can actually pick up a course on it. Um, so a guy by the name of Ramit Sethi, he is the uh, author of, I will teach you to be rich has a program called the briefcase technique. Um, and I had, um, I had purchased that course. Um, I think it's like 200 bucks or something like that. Just researched all of it. And it's, it's basically, it's modern day marketing applied to getting a job. Right. So it's all the marketing stuff I was familiar with anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and just how do you actually put that into practice of getting a job? Right. So if you look at the way that most people look at getting a job, they look at themselves like a shotgun and um, they're going to put, you know, 200 of those little pellets in their thing and they're going to shoot it out at all the jobs and hopefully one of them will land and they'll hit a duck. Right. That kind of, that kind right. of thing. Right. Um, and it's going to spread shot or scatter shot or whatever. And hopefully something will land. Um, and the problem with that approach is that it's a me too approach. It's right. It's what everyone is doing. Everyone is going in and saying like, here's my one resume or, and like, maybe I customize the cover letter, um, for that job. Or, um, you know, if you really want to get into it, maybe you customize some of your bullet points on your, on your resume as you send each one of them in. But most people don't do that. Most people have one, maybe two resumes they send to a hundred different positions. Right. Yeah. Um, and that is not an effective way to get a job in a market where you're competing with 200, 300, 400 other people, right? You want to be the one person that stands out. Um, so I'll give you, I'll give you sort of the whole, whole bit because I think it's a really useful discussion, especially if someone's looking to get a high paying position like I was trying to do, right? I was trying to get into the C level of this company mm -hmm. as a 27 year old, right? Who didn't have <laughs> any of the qualifications, yeah. but I knew I could do the work, right? So like I, I absolutely beyond a shout out knew I could solve the problems they had. So it started off with, um, I, I knew what I was looking for, right? I wanted to be in the marketing sector and I wanted to be in charge of the marketing team, right? So I was looking for director of marketing positions and I was looking for local director of marketing positions. So like I started off on all the job sites and just started filtering out. It's like, okay, I'm looking for director of marketing positions. I'm looking for a small company and I want to work for a big corporate conglomerate. I'm looking for like a local company. So I like, I had all these like little rules that I was looking for because I knew I, I wanted to be talking to the hiring manager myself right? Like the person who was in charge of, of, you know, the guy I was reporting to, I wanted to get hired by, yeah. right? Like if I was going for a director of marketing at Chipotle, you're never going to get to the top of those like that. You're just not right, getting no. there. Um, so like a local or a regional company, like I was looking at, um, I got to meet with the president of the company, right? That was because I was working for this, you know, the C-level position. That means I was, I was interviewing with the president and the CEO, right? Um, yeah. And they were local, um, local individuals, right? So that's, that was one of my criteria because I wanted to hit that level and talk to those people. Got some other benefits out of that too. I got to mentor under like CEOs who like yeah. the CEO owned like 12 different companies. So it was super cool. Wow. Um, but I had, um, I, I had my criteria. I found the position that I wanted um, and I, I narrowed it down to one company and I was like, I want this job, right? And so I'm literally going to spend the next four weeks of my life applying and trying to get this job. And if I don't get this job, I'll do it with another one over the next four weeks. Right. Um, what's interesting, though, is if you put the kind of focus that I put in, it's almost guaranteed that you would get a job, assuming you have the skills to, uh, to right. actually deliver. Um, but they had they had their criteria of what they were looking for. And a lot of them had to do with marketing things. So what I did is I spent about two weeks and I went through every piece of marketing I could find that they'd ever put out online, all their website stuff, everything that they'd ever done um, that I could find publicly. Um, I went through and I actually built, um, a, a, I put together a 40 page report that went over every little different thing that I, that they had and my comments and critiques and ways that they could make it better, um, all the way through all of that. Um, so that was one thing that I did. And the next thing I did, I actually had a book that I had written with a friend and it was a short little like 70 or 97 page book on web development. Um, it was called, uh, why your website annoys the hell out of people. It's really <laughs> um, impactful back in 2009 when you opened a tab and music started playing on websites and there were dancing puppies and everything all over the place. Right. Um, but anyways, um, I went through their website and with my book um, and I, I, um, I took notes on their website for every chapter and I put them in the, uh, in the, in the book, right? It's a little single note thing on every chapter of the book. Mm -hmm. um, then I went and did some S corporate espionage. Um, so I went into the company and, um, and I, basically just knocked on the door and said, Hey, I've got, um, I, I, I wanted to just see what it was about. So I walked around and introduced myself to a couple of people, um, just to find out what their products and services were. And I, you know, they were a solar company. So I was like, I have a house. We might be looking at solar and got, got to look around. And what I was doing 
is I found out the way that they dressed. I found out the way that uh, the uh, the organization, like what they were wearing, mm-hmm. and it was a a uh, um, tan slacks, brown shoes, and a polo shirt type of operation. Right, the CEO all the way up to the CEO. That's the way they all dressed. Um, so um, I actually went and I bought an outfit. Um, I bought tan slacks. I had you know a pair of you know brown leather shoes, and I got a polo shirt that matched the colors of the company. Um, and, uh, um, I came in to, um, the next day I brought a little package cause I found out who the hiring director was. Um, and I put the book in a package with, um, a cover letter, um, and a resume that I had written specifically to hit address every bullet point in their job ad. Um, and I put a four year eyes only thing on it in the name of the, uh, the, um, the guy who was hiring for the position, which was not like they had the HR director who was filtering everything. I didn't want to talk to the HR director. I wanted to talk to the one I'd be reporting to. Right. So I put it for your eyes only. And because I'd gone in before I found their mailbox and I actually went and I put it, put my <laughs> book with the resume and the cover letter in the, the president's box, <laughs> his mailbox. Um, and it's funny. So he, he, he told me later, he came in and he picked that up. And he had a flight up to one of their other offices up in San Francisco. And he read the book all the way there. And he was like, when I was done reading the book, I was like, you were hired. It's like, <laughs> I had to do the rest of I had to do the rest of it. Um, because, you know, corporate laws and all that kind of sure. stuff. He's like, but blew me away that you would even go to that level of detail. Um, but anyways, when I came in for the interview, there were three other people. I was the first interview, but there were three other people there. They were all dressed to the nines. You know, slacks, yeah. tucks and tails. Very, like, it looks like you've ever seen people going for interviews. They dress to the nines. Yeah. I was dressed like they were. I looked like I fit already, right? That's so um, interesting. And I went into the posi- went in for the interview, um, and they sat and he sat down and they started to do the uh, you know those questions, right? It's like you mm-hmm. know what's one one strength or weakness or whatever the stupid questions are that they ask you because yeah. they're they're totally ridiculous and they don't yeah. have anything to do with the thing. And I and I was like I I'm sorry I don't mean to offend you, but I actually brought some things that I think might be more interesting to talk about than some of these these uh, sort of robotic interview questions. If, do you mind if I show you some of this stuff? And he was just like, well, okay, right? Because who <laughs> says that? Yeah. <laughs> right, and, and I plopped on the desk my 40-page marketing plan I had for their business. Wow. Um, and we proceeded to spend the next three and a half hours going over that marketing plan. The other three people that were all waiting for their interviews, they all had to be, be sent home um, and reschedule their interviews for another time, <laughs> right? Um, so awesome. we went over the, the marketing plan and when we, when we were done, like I, I, I controlled the whole interview all the way through when we were done, he was like, can I keep this? And I was like, you cannot, that is mine. Wow. Um, and I was, and I, and he was like, well, we have a second interview, um, that we do with the, uh, the CEO, um, and the whole C-level team. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the accounting director mm-hmm. and the, uh, the legal director and the whole, the whole C-level team for the organization. Um, and I was like, that's fine. Um, and, but what's interesting is because I spent three and a half hours with them, I got to see all the stuff I couldn't see on the surface. Right. So I got all the other problems that they had and I had taken a copious amount of notes during the first interview. Um, and it was two weeks before the next interview. Um, so I spent those two weeks and I solved the whole bunch of the problems that I knew that they had. Yeah. Right. Um, one of them was they had an 8,000 page website that was just bonkers, had all sorts of problems. It was on like eight different domains and had all these different things. It was all over the place and it was just horrendous and it's something they've been struggling with for years um, and gone through three different marketing directors. No one could solve any of their problems. And I spent the two weeks and I, I redeveloped the whole thing from the ground up um, and had it finished and ready to go. Like it was live on a test server when I went in for the next interview. Um, so same kind of thing, go into the next interview with the C-level team, the whole team. And they were like, they get ready to start the questions. And I was like, Hey, before we do that, I actually finished some stuff between the last interview that I think would be really useful to show you based on the problems you guys told me you had in that interview. Um, and this, you know, blew a lot of their tops too. But the, uh, the president guy who I'd done the first interview with was like, yeah, this guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's like, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So I, sh- I showed them all of that. And then the CEO of the company was like, how long would it take you to do that? Cause he thought I was showing them samples. And I was like, what do you mean? And I was like, no, this is done. Like I already finished that. You can, if you hire me, we can flip the switch and turn this on. Wow. Right. Like it's done, ready to go. Um, and, and he was like, like he sat back and he was like, he was like, okay, so I know for a fact that the money that we were offering on the job description is less than what you're worth. He was right. He was like, so what is it that you're expecting to get paid? 
<laughs> and I was like, funny you should ask. Because <laughs> I had done research on what a C-level director of marketing position is. And I had about 20 pages of information on salary for the types of companies that I was that they were. Mm -hmm. And where I was at in the salary range started at 60000 and went up to about 250000 And they were offering $60,000. And I was like, my assumption is you were looking to hire a, uh, a new, uh, uh, an entry-level person um, and hopefully develop them to where you wanted to be. And I was like, problem is I'm not an entry-level person. You know that, obviously. You can see what, what we're doing. Um, and I was like, but I don't think I'm a $250,000 employee yet. One of the reasons I'm here is because I want to develop my skills. And I was like, so I'm thinking I'm probably more in the mid-range. And I was like, so what is it that you're looking to do? Quick pause, guys, on the show. Again, strategically improving your life means doing things with a purpose, but not just with a purpose, doing things that move the needle. And in the realm of physical fitness, if you do not have the right supplements, you will probably not see the gains you're looking for in all the right places. So I want to encourage you to go get some excellent supplements from our friends over at One Mission Nutrition. We are an affiliate of theirs. They offer high quality supplements in pre, pre-workouts, protein drinks, green drinks, all sorts of things. And they're, they're very high quality and they actually help support the troops. So every product you purchase goes towards helping make a strength box for a soldier overseas. And that goes very far in helping them feel comfort and, and love of home as well as getting stronger. So I want to give you the 10% discount that uh, One Mission Nutrition has offered to you as a listener of the Hard Thing Podcast. Again, we are an affiliate of theirs, so uh, you getting a product definitely helps us as a podcast, but go to allegiance.onemissionnutrition.com slash the hard thing podcast, get your 10% discount today. And while you're doing that, I'm going to get back to the show. Right. What are you looking to uh, to hire for? Knowing where I'm at and what I'm looking for, and I showed them the ranges and showed them all this stuff, um, and and you know I let them throw out the first number. But anyways, I got them to give me a um, uh, hundred thousand dollar six figure salary, um, and and I uh, I negotiated with them while we were sitting there. I was like, my other only other thing is that uh, I am an entrepreneur at heart. I've spent my whole life working um, businesses, and um, if you want to hire me, I want to have a work from home like relationship where I'm working from home most of the time. I'll come in at least once a week to meet with the team or do any of the things that I need. I come in more than often that if needed, but my primary position will be work from home. And they were like, we don't normally do that. And I was like, I don't care. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, if you want me, that's the way it's going to go. Um, and at this point, like I held all the cards, right? Mm -hmm. I had, I had all the things that they wanted. Um, and so pretty much they gave me whatever I asked for, which is really cool. And um, when they, when they, when they put the paperwork for setting the position up, I was like, I actually have one more thing. Um, and I was like, I, I spent the last four weeks working on getting this position, right? I didn't apply to any other jobs. Um, I just applied to this one. And I spent the first two weeks doing all of these things. And I showed them the 40 page marketing plan. I was like, and I went over all this with, with uh, uh, the uh, president of the first interview. Um, and I was like, and then I spent the last two weeks building this solution, all of which we can just immediately start using when I hired, I would like to get, um, paid my first month's salary for the last four weeks, hmm. right? Like a signing bonus kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I walked into that position with, um, a signing bonus, like of a first month salary work from home and six figures. Um, and it took me four and a half weeks from the time I closed the doors of my business to have that up and going. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that story epitomizes everything that this podcast is focused on because obviously it's a hard thing. I mean, in, especially now with our, our pandemic, even getting a job can be considered a hard thing for certain people, but getting a specific job that pays exactly, well, maybe not exactly, but around the area that you want doing exactly what you want with a company that you really want to work with uh, is definitely difficult, especially because people, like you said, they do the scattershot approach. But what, what's more, the reason why that epitomizes kind of what this podcast is all about is because you did it strategically. And I think that's a word that is not used enough in today's society. You, in, in my mind, you, you took on that endeavor as if you were trying, you know, you were a spy and you were assassinating a government official. Like you knew everything that was going to happen. You had a plan, you know, exactly, you know, and uh, there, there was none of the other applicants could compete with me. Exactly. Right. They, they couldn't even 
come close to competing with me. Like, because if you compare it, they had 250 other applicants, all of which were doing the scattershot approach with a generic resume and interview style, mm -hmm. right? It was like, if it, like, how, how could they even consider any of them? Yeah. Um, and what's, what's funny is I found out later that my, my book that I'd put in his mailbox, um, he told me afterwards, he was like, we'd already closed down the interviews. We weren't taking any more applica applications. And I had to take your book to the C-level team and be like, we need to add this guy to the roster for the interviews because, well, like, look at this. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then I, I said I beat out 250 other people, all of which had met the qualifications and I didn't. Right. Because yeah. they don't hire based on qualifications. They hi people hire based on your ability to solve a problem. Right. Exactly. Same thing as the marketing. The reason they're buying your products, buying your services, buying anything is because they have a problem and you have a solution. And if you can put those two things together, marketing yourself for a job is the same thing as marketing your products and services as an entrepreneur. It's learning how to find out what's the problem that they have and then how can I dress it in a way that they're going to see it and understand it and communicate with it. Right. That's where where I was like, I need to get this in front of the hiring director and not the HR director. This is why I want to dress like they're dressing because I want them to just see me as part of the team before I get there, right? It's, it's which is, you know, it's like copywriting 101, yeah. talking their language. It's one of the reasons why Trump talks like a third grader, right? <laughs> this guy's had 500 companies. He can talk at a high level if he wants to, yeah. right? He talks at a third grade level because that's the average reading level of the, of the people he's talking to, right? So you talk in their language, you, you dress in their dress and you solve the problem that they're having, right? Um, so it's a, um, it's a really powerful, um, anyways, I, it's one of my favorite stories from, from yeah. like my <laughs> marketing career. I, I certainly enjoyed that story and it definitely has sparked so many I guess intentions within me that I want, I want to go try and things like that. And I, I want to drill down from that story and especially because uh, marketing is something that you have to do, whether you're trying to get a job, whether you're trying to uh, do business, whether you're trying to ask the woman to marry you and you want her to say, yes, you have to market yourself. You have to market in some way. So you mentioned that you have to learn how to solve problems, find problems, identify them and learn how to solve them what sort of advice might you give to someone who maybe doesn't necessarily have that mindset or that skill set? So problem identification is something that, um, that if, if you say to yourself, I don't have that skill set, it's, it's a, it's a lie you're telling yourself because your brain has been developed over, however long we've been developing our human brains to be pattern recognition engines, right? That's what we do. Like if you ever watched a baby, they recognize patterns like amazing. I have four children. Uh, my youngest one's learning to walk right now and running around. And it is amazing the kind of things that we can do with a one and a half year old baby where, where I'm, I'm, I, I, this might be a little bit insane, but I consider my children social experiments that I'm conducting, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, like, I, I play games with my daughter all the time where I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, this is a pink duck and this is an orange duck, right? And it'll be like, can you show me the pink one, right? And see whether, how long it takes her to, to associate pink, right? So, like, the first time you say pink duck, orange duck, can you give me the pink one? She just, like, squeals and does this other thing. The time you get, like, four or five times into saying pink duck, orange duck, she's like, that one's the pink duck. Right. And that one's the orange duck. Um, and you can do that with all sorts of things and they pick it up really, really, really fast. So my point in that is that you already are a pattern recognition engine. That's what the human brain is designed to do is see patterns and recognize patterns. A problem is nothing more than a broken pattern. Right. So what you're looking for in, um, in for problems is in the areas that you're interested in look for things where the pattern is broken, where the rhythm is interrupted, right? Where things aren't going well, right? Um, so I always like to look at things like this. I actually have a, a book writing framework that I use for this. As you, as you look at the existing system for a thing, whatever it is, let's take for just as an example, getting a job, right? Because we just told a story about that. So you look at the existing system for getting a job. What are people telling telling, you know, telling you to do, what are the, the platitudes, the generalities, the things that, you know, the, the step-by-step -step list that you see all over the place. It's like, you know, put out a resume and send it all to your people and, you know, put it up on all the job boards, blah, 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 whatever the things are, you have the generalities. Now, the next question, the next point for that is you want to identify the failure points in that system, right? Where are the things that are going wrong there? 
right? So why is it, you know, why, why, so you ask questions like, you know, why is it not working now, right? Why doesn't it work for everyone? Why doesn't it work because of technology, right? Why isn't it working for, you know, so you want to just ask why, delve into it, see if you can find problems with the existing system, problems with the existing system. You don't stand out. You're not unique. Everyone's doing the same thing, right? So you're looking at, um, you're looking for failure points in the existing system. So, what you do with those failure points is you look at, and this is how you develop a unique solution, by the way, is you look at those, those failure points and you ask a couple of questions. You ask, the first question is why, why is it failing because of that thing? And then second question is what if we changed something, right? What if we made a change to the system in this way, right? What if instead of scattershotting resumes, we laser focused a single resume and a single strategy for a single job position? What does that change? What does it look like? Right. Um, and so it's a what if question. And my, my favorite example for that is what if we had a school for witchcraft and wizardry? Right. Yeah. You might make the first billion dollar author. Um, that's never happened before. Right. It's a really powerful question when asked properly. Um, so when you do that, explore the existing system, identify the failure points, and then you, you exacerbate those. Why do those failure points exist? And what if we changed something? What you end up with is you end up with a solution right? With the solution that you can try and you can test um, and you can bring to market. And what's interesting is when you go through a process like that, 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 uh, that process of here's where I'm at now with a solution is you have a theoretical solution that you can bring to market. Um, that's your unique perspective, your unique solution you can bring. And you have all the marketing you need, right? Because that's the process people are going through in their head is they're looking at the existing system. They're like, you know, I've tried getting a job. And it sucks. And I tried the scatterstop approach and it never works. And I don't get calls back and I don't get interviews and I don't get come back for the second interview and all those things. So there are, there are all those questions. So your marketing is like, hey, have you ever been, you know, trying to get a job? And have you been tried the scattershop approach and had these problems with it? Well, what if you changed a couple of things and did something different? Like your, your marketing language comes from going through that exercise, right? Yeah. So you can actually then present your solution as like, I actually have a solution, let me, you know, uh, you know, I, a, a theory on how we can solve that problem. Why don't you come and explore that theory with me? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's when you can present your solution to them. So the exercise of finding problems is actually the exercise of also building the marketing language to sell that problem to someone as well. So it's really, really powerful. Wow. The marketing is science. Basically you, you create hypotheses and you test them and which everyone's works obviously pays you the most, right? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Richard, I have enjoyed talking with you so much. Um, I, I didn't even get to half of the things I was going to talk about, but we're coming down to the end of our time together. So I want to ask you the final questions. I know we've talked about a lot, but based on our conversation today, what one to three action items would you give our audience to do today or this week to improve their lives? <laughs> so my, uh, my piece of advice that one of my mentors gave me over and over and over again, all growing up, um, was to do the hard things first and everything else will be easy, right? Um, so that's a high level sort of like just a, a mentality is always have the mentality of doing the hard things first, right? So whatever that is. Um, and like, I'm talking all the way down to like, I remember like we've been traveling in an RV and like we had a toilet problem and it broke like every other day for like a week. And I kept having to like take the toilet apart and literally clean shit, <laughs> which is the worst thing ever. Yeah. But like, I know like, like the first sign that you see it's breaking. I'm like, I have to, I just have to do it. And I have to do it right now. Um, even if it's the worst thing ever, because I know if I don't do it now, it just gets worse going, going on. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I fix it now, it'll get easier later. And eventually we actually solved the problem and it's, it's been solved now. But the idea is like it sometimes pretty much all the time, you just have to eat dirt, right? Do the hard thing because when you do the hard thing first and you develop the skills first, your life gets easier. Right. One of the things I've been trying to help my son with right now is he's in homeschool and he's got like four or five subjects that he does. And he has, you know, he really, really loves his science and he really, really loves his math. Um, but when he, or his history, when he gets his math and his English, he like hates those. And he always saves his English for the last part of the day. Um, and then he spends like four hours doing it and then he doesn't have any time to do it. And I've, I've been trying to get him to flip the script. Of like, just start with the hard thing first. Yeah. Right. Start with, get the English out of the way. Right. Spend it because you're fresh. It's the first part of your day. Get it all done. He gets it done in an hour. And then because he's done that, he can get everything else done in his schoolwork day done in, in another hour. Right. And then his school day is two hours instead of six. Yeah. Right. Because um, he did the hard things first. 
All right, um, so that's the first piece of advice. The second one is how do you actually determine what the hard things are? <laughs> and how you should do them. So something that I've been experimenting with, I'm still not great at this myself, um, but I went through a phase in my early entrepreneur career where I thought that it was um, what the way that I, I, I figured life worked was that I needed to work my ass off until I got to a certain point, um, and then I would eventually take a break, right? So that I would I would just work until I dropped kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and there's there's it's a, it's not a bad attitude to have, right? I like. I, I tell people all the time, you can't compete with me because I'll work you under a table, like straight up, right? If you if we were if 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 working was drinking shots, I, I would I would work you under a table, right? <laughs> You'd be down and out long before I ever gave up. So you can't compete with me on that level, right? So that's a good mentality to have, but at the same time, it's also it's it's dangerous and unproductive for a couple of reasons. So one of them um, is you you do not do good work if you're not well rested. So one of the things that like I tried actually in college once to see if I could go without sleeping and get more work done and work just 24 hours a day. I made it about three days before I was puking in the bushes. Oh, so wow. not a good plan. Um, <laughs> and then I was sick for like a week. Right. So like it was just, it was not a good plan. You need sleep and rest. Um, and I've gotten to the point in my business now where I tell people all the time. And if you listen to my podcast, um, we talk about this all the time on our podcast is you want to give yourself permission to play. Right. Um, and what I mean by that is that, play is not something or recreation is not a reward for a job well done play and recreation is a prerequisite for doing good work all right so what i want people to do is understand that you need to have built into your schedule right and like I literally put these things in your calendar what are the things your athletic hobbies the things that you enjoy doing make time for those make time for yourself um, and even if it's more than half your day, that is fine because what you'll find is if you're well rested and then you do the second part of that, which is you do the hard things first, <laughs> um, you can accomplish more in four hours than people who do a bad job do in 12. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and so early in my entrepreneur first five or seven years, I was the kid who, you know, 25, 27 years old, I was working a 16, 18 hour days because I thought that's what you needed to do to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and when I finally got to the point where I was like, that's dumb and I'm not actually enjoying my life. And like, I, and I'm, I'm, you hit limits with your income and hit limits with what you can do, um, because you're tired all the time. Um, give yourself restrictions, right? Creativity thrives with restrictions. So one of the first things I did was like, I will not work more than four hours in a day. That was one of the first restrictions that I did. Actually, I think it was the other way around. I did four days in a week. I was going to take Friday off every week mm -hmm. and then move all of my work into four days during a week. So I started, started off with that kind of restriction. Then I went from, um, from four days to like, okay, if I'm going to do four days, I want to do four hours a day for those four days. Um, and I was giving myself restrictions. Like I need to get the same work product done instead of five days and four days and instead of eight hours and four hours, right? And now it changes the conversation you're having in your head with like, I have this much work to get done today and I have all day to do it. And then it takes you, you just fill up your time instead of like, I've got four hours. And um, what's fun if like, if you're like me, I'm like, I've got four hours. And at two o'clock, I promised my son, I would take him out and teach him rollerblading. And if he, I don't go do that, he's going to cry at my, my, in my doorway. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, so I have emotional incentive to be <laughs> done when I get there. Um, so there's a lot of like little brain hacks I'm giving yeah. you here. Hopefully this is useful, yeah. but um you know, give yourself creative restrictions, right? And it's not going to be the end of the world if you have to work five hours or six hours or eight hours that day to get what you're accomplished, but you sure. have, you've given yourself creative restrictions. Same thing with the five days, right? If you take a day off of your week, if you have to work Friday, it's not the end of the world, right? You've just given yourself like, I want to see if I can accomplish the same work week in four right. days instead of five. What you'll find is you'll be really, really surprised what you can accomplish, especially if you start structuring your day with, let me get the, the most important thing done the first part of the day. Right. And then if you stack that up over the course of time, right, over the last couple of years, I forexed my business in revenue, in number of clients, and number of team members, right? And my average work day right now is two hours. Right. Wow. I work two hours a day. Um, and I travel and I spend the day after, you know, we're, we're here, you know, during our global crisis, we're in a little private resort and we've been at the beach every day and they just opened the pool today for, um, for the shelter in place orders have been lifted. And I spent the afternoon with my kids playing at the pool. Um, and I had this interview and I had two other calls and I spent the rest of the day 
playing with my kids mm-hmm. and I'm, you know, cooking dinner. We had, you know, I, I made a, a, a vodka red wine, um, you know, baked ziti with, you know, chicken stuff for dinner. I spent a couple hours making dinner because I, that's something I enjoy doing and have the time to do, right. Mm-hmm. Something that I consider play. Yeah. Um, and so my, my recommendations, if I could, could list them all out just succinctly hard things first, <laughs> give yourself creative restrictions for your work. Um, and then put one, one thing that moves your business forward every day, right? Um, and stack that up over time. You'll have a tremendous increase in how successful your business is if you do those things. Wow. <laughs> Give yourself permission to play. That's the last one. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I will get those up in the show notes. Um, and then Richard, how can our audience reach out to you, support you, and see what you're up to? Yeah. So um, first thing would probably be, uh, you know, check out our, our podcast. It's called The Hero Show. Um, you can find us on iTunes or um, on my website, which is uh, richardmatthews.me. Um, and, you know, you can check out that podcast. Um, and we got we have entrepreneurs on all the time. We talk about uh, um, their superpowers and stuff like that. It's super cool. Um, so that's first one. And then the second one is uh, we actually work with uh, um, experts expert brand businesses um, who want to either develop their brand, their online products, things like that, and, or develop their uh, podcasts, um, their weekly shows, whether it's video, audio, YouTube, Facebook, whatever it is, we actually help them develop a weekly show. Um, and so that's through our push button podcast brand. Um, so you can check us out there at pushbuttonpodcast.com or you can check all of the podcasts, our podcast out at richardmatthews.me. Um, there's a podcast button on there. Um, you can reach out to us for any of those things. Awesome. Perfect. I will, uh, again, get those links up in the show notes. But Richard, thank you so much for being on the show. I have enjoyed this immensely. Uh, like I said, I didn't get to half the things on here. So again, just thanks You'll for just being on the just have to bring show. me back. We'll, uh, <laughs> yeah. we'll do another episode. Guess so, right? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you guys for listening to another episode What did I tell you? That was an amazing show. And I hope you really paid attention. If not, go back and listen to it again. But he he dropped so many insightful truth bombs, you could say, that I think will actually improve and change your life. Uh, And I want to give you a challenge right now. I want to challenge you to adopt that problem-solving mentality. I want you, between now and next Monday, when we have our next episode, between now and next Monday, identify a problem and solve that problem, preferably in someone else's life, and do it as best as you can. Do it so it looks good, and it's good quality problem solution, okay? Solve someone else's problems, and once you do that, go over to our Facebook group, Facebook group, uh, facebook.com slash groups slash The Hard Thing Podcast, and share with everyone else, and uh, see what kind of problems are being solved by you, And uh, again, just connect with other people who are doing hard things. But I'm really excited to see what sort of problems you solve. And I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, But okay, I think that's it. Uh, We're good for today's episode. But come back on Thursday for our Thursday meditation show. You'll hear from me again, some of my thoughts and musings. Until then, guys, keep doing hard things because you will overcome average.